Welcome to One Plus One, I'm Barry Cassidy. On the show this week is one of Australia's most influential journalists, the ABC's own Fran Kelly. Fran has left her prized breakfast show at RN after 17 years and said goodbye to more than half a million listeners. I'm going to try and find out what drove Fran and what drove her success. Listening to Radio National Breakfast. Hi, I'm Frank Kelly, and it's 11 minutes past six. Good morning, Frank. Good morning, Frank. Good morning, Frank. Good morning, Frank. Good to be with you, Thanks Frank. Thanks for having me, Frank. Good morning, Frank. Frank. Good morning, Frank. Good morning, Frank. Good morning, Frank. Hey, friend. It's 8.30. You're listening to RM Breakfast. Well, now joining me from London is the ABC correspondent. Frank Kelly. Frank Kelly. ABC News. London. Kelly London. reports from London. Hello, Prime Minister. Good morning, Fran. I just want to let you all know that my days presenting RM Breakfast are coming to an end. After 17 years, it's time. And thanks very much for joining us. Well, Fran, welcome to One Plus One. Barry, it's fabulous to be here. And you get to answer the questions. I hope that's not too weird. Well, it's, I'm more nervous this side of it, of the questions, than that side, I have to say. Well, the more I looked into your, your background and, and your career, the more I see that we have in common. Um, just starting all the way back. Uh, you were brought up in a large Catholic family, as I was. You were the fourth of six kids, and I was. Um, how important was the, the, the religion in your family? Was it important or, or just incidental? Oh, it was completely important. It, it defined my family and what we did all weekend and much of the week, really. My mum and dad were like pillars of the, of the local church and we were like a sort of a band of a volunteer army whenever anything needed doing, like a fate needed running or a newsletter needed put out. You know, that was us up working the Gestetner or we spent, we used to spend at least one day every Easter weekend counting the Project Compassion money around our kitchen table. So mm. that was very embedded in, in my family upbringing. The other similarity is that neither of us really got started in politics until we were much older. Um, I think I was 28 when I wrote my first political story and you got started late because you got into journalism at a late age. Yeah, I was 29 when I did my first radio story and um, I, was, I was really only 28 when I decided I, I wanted to do journalism. I, I'd forgotten. When I left school, I applied for the local cadetship at the Adelaide Advertiser and it came down to two, the final two and there was only one job and I didn't get it. And oh. it was, it was, I just completely forgot about journalism and went off and did a whole lot of other fun things and really didn't think of it again till I was overseas on a holiday and I thought, what am I doing with my life? And, and um, I'd got interested in a radio show that friends of mine were putting out on Triple R Community Radio in, um, in Melbourne. And it was a new kind of, of doing news and current affairs and it really interested me. And I thought, that's what I want to do. And, and I just decided and I just tried every trick in the book I could to get in and eventually I jagged it. I was lucky. All right, I want to talk about that and we'll come back to it, but there's that period in between. Um, you went to university in Melbourne? No, in Adelaide. I did an arts degree. And then I got a job at Flinders Uni as the activities director. That involved putting on <laughs> concerts and film nights and barbecues with a barrel and, you know, with, you know, lunacy week and things like that. Did you book so, any big bands? Oh, I booked really big bands. Most, most of them, I'm, I then went to La Trobe Uni where I had the even more fantastically named job as entertainment director. Uh -huh. um, so that was just out and out fun, that job. Um, yeah, big bands, particularly at La Trobe, we had a huge room there, 2,000 kids could fit in and we we did, you know, all the big Australian bands, Cold Chisel, Midnight Oil, um, mm. Ice House, but also Simple Minds. Um, but one of my favourite stories is that in Adelaide, bands would come through and there were very few places for them to play, really. So the, the organisers would be begging the unis to put them on because they were trying, especially a new band. So I got tickets to go see this new band nobody had heard of called Talking Heads. That was pretty cool. And, um, but I, they, I got begged to hire this band called Flowers and they were down from Sydney, I think it was. And I, I'd burnt my budget, we had nothing. And I said, I got nothing. And by then, that was for a lunchtime concert where you'd actually put the, the refectory tables together, gaffer tape them together, and that was the stage for the band, okay, at a lunchtime. 
And um, they were begging me to put this band on because they had no gigs for them, basically. Flowers became Ice House. We paid 50 oh. bucks, I think it was, to put ice, uh, Flowers on at um, Flinders Uni and it was a sensational concert. So they know that you gave them their big break? Yeah, I'm sure they're well aware of that. And, and then you, you played in a band yourself or at least sang in a band? Yeah, yeah, I sang in a band. And I what? sang in a few bands, but yeah. The, there was one called Toxic... A toxic Shock. Toxic that was the old shock. girl band in Melbourne. Right. Yeah, and... Um, and were you the, the lead singer? Yeah, yeah, I was the singer in the band and we were sort of half punk. I don't know how punk you really are if you're doing a cover version of Love Potion Number no. 9, but anyway, <laughs> um, we, it was that kind of time and it was the time for all girl bands and we had a bit of a following. We had a couple of residencies at the time in Melbourne and more fun than you can poke a stick at. Best so fun I've ever had. You were sort of more Susie Cottero than maybe Olivia Newton-John, that kind I of style? I definitely was not Olivia Newton-John. <laughs> I was much more Susie Cottero or I like to think, you know, a bit more Lena Lovitch, a bit more edge. So when you finally did uh, get into journalism, um, you dabbled with sport for a while, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I, um, I, my first real job in journalism, I moved to Sydney from Melbourne for a three-month contract with Triple J on a program, a current affairs program called The Drum. And that was sort of throwing me right into it, right onto live radio, reporting the whole bit, you know, and I really didn't really know what I was doing, but it was fantastic and it was a fantastic training ground. But there was no ongoing job, so I, I managed to string that out for a, for a year. And then they, the ABC offered some traineeships, which didn't happen all the time. And I applied for a couple of them, and the one I got was sport. And I loved it, absolutely loved it. But um, the, 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 the bloke in charge of, of all the sports coverage on the ABC, the guy who hired me was a lovely guy, guy called John Parker. He called me aside after a few months and said, I think, I think you're destined for current affairs. I think that's where you're going to fit better. And I was a bit heartbroken at the time. I thought he was saying, you're no good at this sports right. game. Um, but I, now I've, liked, I've reimagined that as what he was saying is that's, that's, your be- that's where you're going to fit best. And he was right. So eventually you went into politics uh, or political reporting. Were your parents as surprised as mine were when you did that? Yeah, my... Um, in fact, I was just thinking about this the other day. Not my mother so much. She was really interested in public affairs, really, I suppose. And um, she'd always... The lesson from mum was you can do anything. You can do anything. So th- I was never pigeonholed anywhere. And, and when I went off to do what I was doing, which was working in, you know, booking bands and things like that, she, I think she honestly thought I'd gone a bit <laughs> awry, really. But she never said anything. But my dad is a very gentle soul and I came around one night to tell I wasn't living at home to say I'm going off, I've got in a job in journalism I'm, or I can't remember if I was going to try or I'd got it. And he came in and he, he, just me and him in the room and he sat me down and he said, darling, do you really think you're cut out for this job? And I, I didn't, I said, why, Dad? I said, yeah, I think I am. He said, he said you know, it's not a very nice, they're not very nice people, journalists. You know, it can be a very nasty world. I'm just, I'm just not sure it's the world for you. And um, how wrong he was. <laughs> I, I, I read somewhere where your mother sort of had to encourage him to come in and listen to the radio at times and uh, almost sort of corral him into coming in. Well, yeah, she, um, <laughs> she was, you know, very proud of, of the work I did when, she, when, when I bob up on the radio. And Dad was out the shed usually and not really interested much. And he's also a little, pretty deaf, my dad. But when I would come on the radio, Mum would ring a cowbell. She'd have a cowbell <laughs> in the kitchen and that was a sign for Dad to come in. But later, <laughs> after Mum had, had died, Dad was living alone and I'd go visit him frequently down in Adelaide. And I'd always, you know, say, oh, you know, how do you think I'm going, Dad? And he'd say, oh, oh, oh Franny, the, the, the radio got tuned. I can't tune you in. So I'd, I'd you know, dutifully tune in the radio to our network and go off to Sydney again. And every time it happened, in the end he said, actually, darling, I'm not interested in anything you talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Politicians is, you know, not his game. Yeah. With um, RN then over, over 17 years, and it's, um, it's a really tough, tough gig, one of the toughest, partly because not just the hours, which we'll talk about, but the, um, the fact that it's a national program, you can't leave one state behind. You can't be Sydney-centric, which is a, a complaint that's often made about the ABC and other organisations. Mm. Uh, how, how did you find sort of balancing all of that? Well, I'm not sure we always get that right. I've, I've had no interest in state-based, um, you know, in any state-based gig at all. I've always wanted to... Well, what, what, what I love about this 
show and what attracted to me was the breadth of it, was not just national but international. I don't think we always do succeed because we don't have a big enough staff to have representation across the country. Um, most of our staff is in Sydney. I think sometimes we do lapse into being Sydney-centric, but we try really hard and we have terrific reporters who voluntarily take on a bit of an interest in Cathy Van Exel, our, our Queensland reporter. She's always sort of harnessed the Northern Territory in particular and a bit of the West. And the Melbourne reporter, their brief was always also a bit of Tasmania. Maybe I'm, maybe I bring the Adelaide coverage, I'm not sure, but we've always got an eye out for these things. And do you enjoy the immediacy of the whole thing? When, when stories break, and you're live to where you've got a live microphone in front of you. It's like a drug. Yeah. It's like a drug. I love it. Mm. And, um, and, I th and, and we're good at them. You know, now we're quick. Radio has the advantage of being a very immediate medium. It's a very quick medium. You don't have to fool around with too much gear. Wait it's, for the pictures. Well, exactly right. You just got to, you know, jump on the phone. Um, in the old days, it used to be sort of look through the telephone book. Now you just jump on social media, you find people and... Before you know it, there you are, live to air, and it's um, it is yeah, completely intoxicating. Then COVID, of course, in the last couple of years, has been such a dominant issue. Um, a lot of people work from home. You did as well, but not everybody has a full radio studio set up in the house. No, we it, it was remarkable, and you know, hats off, you know, shout out to the the sound engineers at, at Radio National. To be honest, they were incredible. We things were moving a little bit slowly and we were wondering about the protocols and then I noticed one day the number of people that came through my studio and I'm thinking, this is a recipe for disaster here. <laughs> so for a start I made them bring in sort of wipes and things and then I realised pretty early on that if there's something goes wrong in, in the building, then we're in trouble. So I started talking to the engineers, um, the sound guys, about what could I do, how can we set up at home and how quickly, and we decided really quickly and, the, and within a couple of days we'd made the switch and I had an engineer with me at my dining room table for two days and then we decided I was right to fly solo and um, away we went. Were there any slip ups? Did you find that at times you just struggled to get your head around the, the well, technical aspects? I mean, if you thought too hard about broadcasting to the nation from your dining room alone at sort of six in the morning um, with just sort of the buster dog underneath for company, it was a little strange. And because there's a performative aspect to, to you know, doing live radio mm -hmm. every morning and, and there's people, you know, through the, through the glass that I'm talking to all the time and you can't have quite that immediate. We did have some comms but it's not... It's not that immediate. So it was different. I mean, the team were incredible. My executive producer was very, very pregnant, so she was banned from coming in to the building. So she suddenly couldn't be EP anymore. So we had two brand new EPs sharing the job, working remotely. It was a big toll on them and everyone just stepped up. We had a few NBN issues early on where suddenly everything would freeze and I had no idea why. And, you know, I'd be in the middle of the story and about to go to the next one. I couldn't get the lead up and I'm um, texting and it was nightmarish. But um, there was one morning where I was connected to the NBN box by a blue cord that runs right across my house to the next room behind the television. And um, it froze five minutes before I was going on air. And that meant I had to run across the room, pull the TV cabinet out, turn off the box, turn it on again, wait for it to boot up. They're, you know, freaking out, obviously, mm -hmm. back here. And um, it's, you know, I think it was 50 seconds to go and they've got Matt Bevan sitting in the chair ready to do it. And I said, no, no, it's going to be all right, it's going to be all right, it's going to be all right. And literally 20 seconds I saw it click in and I go, OK, we're cool. And um, so there was a few of those moments, yeah. but remarkably hardly any of them. We did it for five months mm. and the real, really the only hiccup was if the postman would come before nine and then Buster would go off. Right. Sometimes it's some inopportune moments. But 18 months of rolling. Oh, that's Buster. I'm sorry. Uh, good morning, Buster. Buster's Buster, right. apologies, everyone. The postie arrived and we weren't expecting them. <laughs> sorry about that. So there was the occasional intervention yeah, from the dog. Which the crowd loved. Yeah. But COVID as an issue, it, um, well, it's unprecedented for two years. We've never had an issue uh, dominate uh, discussion and the media in the way that it has. Um, every day you must be making judgments about whether 
that's what the audience wants or is the story so important and it impacts on everybody's lives, we just have to keep going with it? Was, was that a daily conversation? It was a daily conversation which I think I, I led because it was clear to me from the feedback I was getting very immediately from the audience, people were frightened. Um, it was overwhelming them. You know, there was a lot of figures and possibilities and bad scenarios being fly flying around. So I, the feedback I took to the team was, okay, we need to give people information. This is what people need here. We don't need any fear. We don't need conspiracy theories. We don't, we need facts. Mm. And, um, and for a while there, that's what we did. We, we just tried to bring information and we devoted entire shows really for weeks to it. And then I'd get the feedback this is all getting a bit depressing now. I'm home alone and all I'm hearing is this, you know, can you give me some good news for a change? So then we tried to bring in some of the, you know, the terrific funny songs on YouTube and stuff like that to lighten it up. But, you know, there's a rhythm to these things and it, and it changed and it ebbs and flows and then you bring it all back and, you know, when there's another lockdown and people are saying, oh, you're too, you know, Melbourne-centric, but you've got to think about that audience who were captive mm you'd know, in your houses for all those time with all those pressures. And I just felt like it was really the, the duty of the program to reflect that and keep a focus there so they didn't feel abandoned. The other aspect of it was the, the parochialism that emerged state by state. And sure, people wanted to, to minimise COVID. They wanted to save as many lives as they could, so they supported their Premier. Um, and then there were others who were saying, well, that's just sycophantic, you know, you're, you're supporting the Premier through your, your political beliefs or whatever, and you had this constantly going. Mm -hmm. And then eventually states started attacking one another and it, it just got very ugly. Yeah, which was um, inevitable, I guess. I mean, look at the history of our Federation and look at Commonwealth state relations. It's ne never usually been a happy thing, really. That that sort of parochialism from the audience is really interesting. I still, if if I'm... There's still a proportion of the audience that perceives anything negative I might say about Victorian lockdowns or policy responses as Dan bashing. I think by and large the feedback from Victorians, especially last year, was we are happy for these. We want, we want to be kept safe. We, we are, prefer this decision to the other. There was a lot of criticism from Victorians of Gladys Berejiklian for being too slow to lock down yeah. and that then turbocharged once, of course, Delta moved across to Victoria. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of parochialism um, and it's quite quite heart, heartfelt. There's a lot of fury. Where the tribes really get involved, the political tribes and the, the audience, is through interviews, right? That's, that's when the emotions really run high and you've done so many political interviews, but nothing really gets them more agitated than that. Are you, are you conscious of that every time you... <laughs> Oh yeah, if I'm not conscious, I just glanced at the screen and it's coming through thick and fast. And mm. today it's, you know, particularly cranky and they don't hold back. And sometimes I think, really, you think you can say that to me <laughs> when I'm on air doing my job? What's remarkable is that within the space, literally on the text line, for instance, say, or the tweets, literally within five texts, I can be accused of going soft on a certain, say it's a government minister, going soft and here you are, LNP stooge, you know, I must get that 30 times a day. And I can get accused of being, you know, a, a, a Labor MP in disguise or, you know, when are you going to run for the Labor Party? Literally that can happen within, it's the one interview <laughs> yep. and it's, it's that kind of feedback. People are very engaged. It used to be the audience would get really heightened around the election campaign maybe a couple of months beforehand. But I think since the last election and through to now, it just hasn't dropped off that kind of, mm. you know, vehemence around a person, you know, they, they're only hearing things through their own political lens, so much of the audience. It's really, it's really changed. Yeah, really I, changed. I've, I've listened to hundreds of your interviews and I, I never detect any difference in style or approach depending on which particular party, political party, is sitting there that day. And I think the intensity rises depending on the issue yeah. and, and not on uh, who the individual is. But do you have a golden rule around interviewing? Is there something, some rule that you follow above all? The rule I bring to every interview, and political interviews in particular, is, OK, what is it the audience wants to hear from this joker? You know, what do they want to know? You know, it might be an, it might be a, an accountability interview, it might be a fact-finding interview, it might be a new policy that's just come out. We don't have long. There's no time for dud questions. So you've got to get in there and get out of there as quickly as you can. And so because of that too, my style is 
I tend not to do the repeat question, you know, but let me ask you again, but let me ask you again. That tended to not be my style. There was a period about a few years back where I, I got the message loud and clear from the audience, they wanted me to do a bit more of that. They didn't want these people to be just able to slip out. So, yep. you know, I've added a bit more of that uh, into I've, my I've interviews. I've found that what makes people angry when they listen to your interviews is when the politician doesn't answer the question. Yeah. But what Which makes them pretty much even always. <laughs> angrier is if they think that you're not persisting. Yeah. That you've, 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 you've got to at least let them know they're not, uh, not answering the question That's and it. ask it again. And, and I think you just need to get to a point where once you've satisfied the audience that you're not going to get an answer yeah. one way or the other, then you can move on. And that's a change from the audience, I think, and a change for me because I used to just think the audience is smart enough to hear that this person's not answering the, the question. So the point is put mm. the question, put the pressure on, hear they're evading and move on to the other important issue we need to deal with. But the audience let it be known to me that they didn't want that. They wanted more. They, they wanted more pressure. Throughout your time on the program, uh, of course, the, the same-sex marriage debate uh, must have been a tough one for you because you had some personal investment in it. And I just wonder sometimes when you were hearing both sides of it and some, some strong things were said, did you find that a particularly difficult period? Um, I did. I did because, you know, I, I have a female partner. We've been together for 30 years. We've raised children together. You know, we've lived a family life. And there was moments in the debate where I would be sitting very close in small studios with politicians and others who would be vehemently arguing that it was a wrong, it, it was not a healthy thing for kids to be raised in a same-sex mm. relationship, family, that um, therefore that, that my lifestyle and the, my parenting, the co you know, step-parenting was wrong and harmful. And I found that very difficult to, you know, sit and listen with and bring objectivity to, which is, you know, my role. So how, how did you cope? How did you deal with that? Well, I just summoned every bit of experience and professionalism I could. Stay calm. And stay calm and soldier on and it would be gone in eight minutes was really what I told myself. But, you know, it was a national debate. All sides of the story needed to be told and, and heard. The country wasn't as one on it. Um, so it was, it was my job. Um, but that was, there were moments when probably the only time really where I found that personally difficult. Mm. So with all those thousands of interviews, is there one that stands out? Oh, Vary, I, th I think you'd know this is the hardest question of all because once I come off air, it's hard to remember what I just did for the last yeah. two and a half hours. Um, speaking this year alone, there's been so many big themes for this year, important themes, the pandemic being one of them, of course, but also the issue of women and women's sexual safety around Parliament House and beyond. I think that's a major theme for this year and a major political story too. And I remember when I interviewed Karen Andrews, who was then the science minister, and uh, about women in the Liberal Party and the terrible goings on that were, you know, were being revealed uh, once Brittany Higgins came forward with her allegations of rape in a, in a cabinet minister's office. And the, the Liberal women by and large were towing the, the line and were being pretty quiet. And Karen Andrews came on and I, I thought it would be the same and she suddenly broke out of the mould. I've had enough and I want to see other women and other people empowered to speak up about behaviour that is just not acceptable. It was heartfelt and you could tell this was the woman talking, not the Cabinet Minister. And, um, and she didn't even back off then when I asked her about, you know, changing the culture of the party to be more reflective and in tune with with women and these issues, she came pretty close to saying she thinks perhaps they, they do need to look at quotas. And as you know, that's never been, that's been a bridge too far for Liberal women uh, in, in particular. Um, so I thought that was a breakthrough interview. And I'm pretty sure that if Scott Morrison was listening, and, and we know they're, they're all listening, um, he would have got the message. Away from politics though, didn't Boy George famously hang up on you? <laughs> He did, which was heartbreaking, old rocker that I am, big fan of Boy George. And um, he did. I was, I think, not even two minutes into the interview where he said, boring, this is boring me, and hung up the phone on live radio. You keep referring to me in past context. We're actually talking in real time. Yeah, but maybe now the times have moved on and the gender bending is not, um, is not such a surprise. But back then it was. Were you aware of the impact of that on kids? You're boring me. Goodbye. <laughs> He's gone. Boy George has gone. Which was, as I say, a shock because, you know, what I'm a fan. What did you say to offend him? Well, I, I'm still not entirely clear. I think 
he, I was harking on his past and let's face it, there's nothing, you know, more, more offensive to a, an old rocker than the, the notion they might be an old rocker, not a current one. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I think I was harking back, whereas he wanted to be talking about, you know, his new album and the great work he's doing today. But really, he barely gave me a chance. And the, imagine, do you know how many Twitter followers Boy George has? It's a lot. And he took mm. to the Twitterverse and off it went. And mm. anyway, yeah, it was, it was a surprise. <laughs> You mentioned your partner, Marion Frith, and I, I recall, uh, I think when I was first in Canberra, she was working for the Canberra Times and, uh -huh. the, and then the agent. D did she have much of an influence over you in terms of moving on from uh, from the RN position? From the show? Yep. Uh, yes, yeah, she did. She, look, she, had a, she has a lot of influence, obviously, on everything, but she's lived with the, with the, with the routine for nearly 17 years. It's a punishing routine. I have to have a nap in the middle of the day, which means, you know, the house has to be quiet. And if the, someone comes to the doorbell, Marion has to sort of fly down the stairs before the dog goes, you know, as you can imagine. So it's really impacted the life she leads as well as the life I lead. So there's all of that. She's been a great supporter as a journalist. She's been, you know, she's a fan of the show. She's a, a critic of the show. She feeds in when she feels like it, but, um, there was one moment in May this year, actually, when I was in the middle of the show and I happened to see there was a text from Marion, which is rare, not, not that rare, but it's not that usual. And I looked at it and it said, retire now. And I'm like, what's that? And I'm trying to do an interview. And when I got a break in the show, I looked at what she meant and she sent an article, a medical research article, talking about the growing research that shows a link between, um, especially as you get older in life, I think it was over 45, um, if you're regularly getting less than six hours sleep, it has real impacts for um, the onset of dementia and just general, you know, um, degeneration of your brain power. And um, it was quite frightening because I rarely get six hours sleep during the week. And um, it, it really had a big impact on me. And the way she sent the message too had an impact on me. Yeah, it's said that if uh, if you go, if you're invited to dinner, to dinner at your place, the, the instructions are in by six, out by eight, and I mean it. And that's right. <laughs> and if I don't mean it, Marion takes charge. Yeah, it's yeah. family tea and it's yeah. been like that for a long time. And people pretty much, you know, pretty good about it. Occasionally they forget, but yeah, there's just, well, I have work to do. So it just means I've got to start the work at eight o'clock rather than early. Yeah. You can't clock off. I mean, you're, you're, the moment you get off air, you're already thinking about the next program. Oh, the moment we're off air, we are already having the editorial meeting for the next program. Um, yeah, it, it is a beast because I have to, obviously, uh, the amount of politics that, you know, I'm doing within this program, I have to keep across those debates too. I've got a you know, sensational team behind me, don't get me wrong. Um, and and they are, they're really committed, experienced journalists. But what it means is they're working through the day too, preparing briefs that I then need to get across in the evening because that's when they've finished their day's work. So I need to consume those and absorb those so then I can do the interviews bright and early the next morning. So that's mm. the routine of it. And, uh, it. I, I think about it. It's a wild your, ride sometimes. I try and line up your career with somebody else and along the way and Paul Murphy comes to mind. Uh, Paul has dedicated himself to radio. He was, he was the, a thorough professional. Um, you and I were both at, at his funeral. I, I just regard him as an absolute legend. Yeah, he was the best. I mean, I don't even think you should compare Paul and I in the same breath, really. But he was, of, of any journalist I've worked with, some fabulous journalists, Paul is the one. He was the best political interviewer, I think, by far, that the country's seen. I worked as a very young journalist alongside him, you know, prepping stories with him. And I really learnt a lot from the way he prepped for an interview and prepared yeah. an interview and conducted the interviews. And I still, every time I say, with respect, Minister, I've got Paul Murphy in my brain. Paul Keating spoke at Paul Murphy's funeral and he said this, this guy was no patsy. Dealing with him, you knew he was no mug. He had an edge. His line of inquiry always had structure, always objectivity. And in my judgment, he could have been talking about you. I think all of that lines up with the way you operate. So well done on your contribution. I hope you continue to contribute something for years to come. Me too. And thank you for joining One Plus One. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Baz.